So this afternoon <coughs> I wanted to keep going with the sequence but with the caveat that although it feels a little bit linear because it is a causal sequence of course in real life things don't quite happen in order so any of these links can uh, can be strong or weak at any given time and they also feed back on each other so um, even if one is weak don't worry you can strengthen another one and that will feed back so we go through this process time and again at ever deepening levels I guess um, depending on yeah, which one is strong or weak for you and sometimes it's nice to know that it's nice to sort of detect where the troubles may be um, broadly speaking and I'm not sure if I really go with this or not but broadly speaking in the sort I think it's in the uh, Visuddhimagga it categorizes people's tendencies into either greed predominant or aversion predominant or delusion predominant which I guess we all are because that's the underlying cause of the others but um, sometimes it's nice just to notice that because if you do have a tendency to being a little bit negative or fault finding meta practice is a really good one to emphasize like have a lot of that in your practice whether you start at the beginning of your sitting with metta or you make it one of your main practices in daily life similarly if you have a lot of greed you know if you're more kind of the um, greedy type it can be nice sometimes to just do practices that um, maybe don't veer too much on anything that could lead to more indulgence so metta can sometimes have as its enemy a sense of clinging or desire of course that's not real metta that's not real loving kindness but it can lead to that um, classically in Buddhism we say that practices that look at the kind of um, disgusting nature of the body and usually it's supposed to be our own body sometimes in monasteries you know people tend to take it as the opposite gender if they're heterosexual and um, which I don't know it's very uh, very wholesome thing to do because we can't blame other people for our lust, for our passion, for our craving. Um, but really it's just to get um, more of a realistic sense of what this body is and how much it can and cannot offer us in terms of lasting pleasure and satisfaction. And then if you're more um, inclined to kind of not really knowing what's going on, more confusion or delusion, maybe some blankness, dullness, etc then to sharpen up the mind with maybe a more analytical practice, something like a Vipassana practice or even being aware of the breath. It can be tricky because the breath is quite subtle, but it can also help to sharpen up the mind. So that's just, anyway, an aside, but to point out that this is a very individual path and it'll, it'll operate quite differently in all of us. It's sort of beyond our own control. But roughly speaking, I wanted to talk today a bit more about how the happiness leads to deeper states of meditation. So we talked about PT, which is rapture or meditative bliss, if you like, that can be quiet, it can also be quite rousing. It can be sometimes like um, waves going through the body or like a shower. Sometimes it's like a sudden flash of kind of pins and needles, not really pins and needles, but kind of uh, goosebumps or chills, which feels pleasant sometimes it feels like half of the head sort of suddenly dissolves and uh, sometimes it can be very gentle very quiet but uh, the next link after that sometimes we have to learn to to be with it and to open up to it um, and if we're not used to these pleasant feelings there can be a bit of resistance to that at first so quite often I I learn to just allow it to run its course and to allow the body and mind to soak up as much happiness as it wishes to do and at a certain point it's almost like you've drunk your fill you've delighted you've re-energized refreshed the mind and after a while the mind kind of gets tired of that it's almost too stimulating um, too coarse and naturally on its own it starts to settle down into what we call tranquility so this is a much softer, quieter, smoother kind of experience. And in the text, it's likened to being in the desert, hot and thirsty, and suddenly coming across the shade of a tree and just sitting under that shade and relaxing. A little bit like that image of the Buddha under the rose apple tree. Feeling tranquil, feeling kind of mellow and just relaxed. Everything's quiet. You could sit there for hours 
or maybe like being in a deck chair on a beach and maybe not a British beach, but <laughs> a beach somewhere in the tropics, you know, and just relaxing and feeling really at ease. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to go anywhere. You can just really rest the body and mind. So after lunch or so, you may feel tranquil, but whether or not that's the right kind of tranquility, there is a tendency for that sort of uh, tranquility to lead to drowsiness. And especially if you are more the sort of delusion tendency, not really type, but if delusion tends to be a habit of the mind, then it can lead to a kind of dullness. But the tranquility that leads to happiness and leads to samadhi is, uh, is quite bright. There's a lot of awareness there. So if you do feel dull or tired, try not to fight it, because fighting it tends to uh, use too much energy and you end up kind of swinging from dullness to restlessness again, and then you're restless and you try to calm it down and then you get drowsy and go back into dullness. So it becomes a tug of war. But the best thing to do is just let the mind dull out for a little bit, but don't worry about it. Just be with it, be kind to it. And eventually when that lifts, you'll probably find that the mind is peaceful, but it's also quite, quite present as well. Of course, the difficulty with this can be that you've been sitting already for quite a long time. So by the time your mind wakes up again, your body is quite tired, you need to move. But if you can actually continue to sit at that time, continue to just uh, maybe change your posture, sit in a chair and allow the mind to brighten up, then it can start to lead into this sukha, the happiness that is described as the um, proximate cause to deep meditation. So that kind of happiness is called sukha. And uh, the Buddha likened that to the same person who was just sitting under the tree in the shade, feeling tranquil, now plunging into a really beautiful lake. And you have to change the temperature of the lake depending which country you're in. <laughs> but if you're in that hot desert, then it's going to be quite a cool, fresh lake that you can immerse yourself in and feel really refreshed. If it's England, then it's probably like going into a beautiful warm lagoon and just really relaxing even more deeply. But there's also more of a feeling of pleasure there. And um, one of my teachers, Shaila Kasrin, she's um, a laywoman, but she has amazingly uh, deep meditation and a lot of clarity in the way she uh, teaches and gives instructions, especially with samadhi, but also in uh, insight as well. She um, calls this kind of happiness contentment, which is quite a nice translation of sukkha because it is a happiness that, that is enough. It's not the happiness that leads to more wanting. It's a happiness that's truly satisfied. So there's a sense of ease. And it's quite mellow. I think of it as like a sort of sweet mellowness, but with a sense of meaning. It feels profound. It feels like uh, there's a purpose to this kind of happiness. And that purpose and benefit, uh, according to the suttas, is the samadhi is the deepening of meditation. So it is the proximate cause. So states of deep meditation are born from happiness, born from contentment rather than striving. And that's what makes them so different from attainments, you know, from stages or um, kind of badges that you give to yourself. It's not that at all, it's a letting go. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how this happens depending on the kind of meditation we're practicing. So earlier today we talked about um, breath meditation and starting by watching the breath coming in, going out and just knowing, getting some clarity around what's happening, just being aware of that as it happens in the moment, right in the moment so that you can actually sustain your awareness on a full breath. And after a while, the mind quietens. It's as though it starts to rest with or even surf with that breath. And a sense of pleasure arises. That's the PT. And after some time with the PT also, that starts to settle. It starts to strengthen, first of all, and starts to settle and become more tranquil. And the next stage of meditation in the third tetrad is that the mind gets liberated. It's called vimochayam chittam. So this means the mind becomes free. And again, free from what? Mostly free from the five hindrances, which is why this is such a delightful state. 
You know, the hindrances are things that pull the mind down. They make the mind basically miserable, right? I mean, anger is a very obvious example of that. Any kind of anger or ill will, <coughs> even restlessness, is quite an unpleasant, unhappy state of mind. And anger is one of the easiest things to work with because it's so obviously suffering, right? And metta and anapana help to overcome that. So these hindrances have now gone from the mind and this is why the mind is free. And the meditation is becoming more and more um, disembodied in the sense that all the energy is going into the mind. So what can start to happen in the anapana meditation, the breath meditation, once you get to what my teacher calls the delightful breath, is that that breath becomes incredibly subtle so that you can't even really tell whether it's coming in or going out. There's just this perception of breath and it's very beautiful, very smooth. And sometimes it can seem like the breath completely disappears. Actually, the breath hasn't disappeared, but we're starting to see it with our mental eyes, if you like. It's starting to change its appearance. It's starting to manifest differently to the mind. And the main manifestation of that is just of bliss, of happiness, of joy in the mind. So sometimes at this point, meditators think, oh no, I have to go back to the breath, what's happened, it's disappeared. But at this point, just like every stage in the, in the practice, the best thing to do is just to wait, to just keep quiet, accept whatever's happening right in front of you, because this is a natural process. It's part and parcel of the practice. It's supposed to happen. And for a while, there might be a, a so-called blank. So some people get a bit lost here. And um, if you want to read more about this, there's a beautiful book by Ajahn Brahm called Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond. And it's that bit between the bliss and the beyond <laughs> that we can get lost in. It can be a little bit like what's going on and the mind gets restless again or it gets involved again. It's the kind of sticky fingers coming in to kind of, hey, hey, what's happening, you know, should I get involved here? But again, the best thing to do is just to wait. And after a while, it's like going from a, a dark room, in, uh, sorry, a light room, a really light room into a dark room. So at first, you can't see very much. So this is that space where the breath has gone. You can't really see what's going on. But if you just wait for a while, you start to get your night vision and you start to see shapes, you start to be able to make out the contours and the colours in the room. And in a similar way, the breath starts to appear again, but quite often it appears differently. And this can manifest maybe as a light in the mind, or sometimes uh, even visions in the mind, you know, whatever you associate that happiness with, in a sense. And this is what um, is called, I guess, by many meditation teachers, a nimitta. So these are kind of the mental representation of the breath. And uh, sometimes people, you know, wonder what's going on again and think, oh, maybe I'm distracting myself, maybe this shouldn't happen. And sometimes a sense of fear can arise. You know, you sort of see these funny visions or you get this light that seems very bright or very powerful. And there's a sense of, oh, I don't know what's happening. I'm, I'm a little bit out of control. And uh, the Buddha talked about all of this in the suttas, in the context of three monks that were training under him. So it's quite reassuring when we read these things because they also were struggling at this stage. And they went to the Buddha and said, well, we get these lights and these visions of forms, but they don't last very long. They disappear after a while. And we cannot understand the reason for that. And the Buddha says, he goes through a big long list of possible reasons and uh, one of the first ones he, he um, describes is fear. Fear can come up at this stage because the mind's getting quite powerful and something's happening that, you know, you're maybe not used to happening and you don't really know what it's all about. And so a sense of fear can arise because really what's happening is that you're getting a little bit out of the way and we're so used to being in control, that's scary to the sense of self. So we just have to learn to relax with this. There's no kind of instant solution. It's almost part and parcel of this process that a little bit of fear may arise in the beginning. But see if you can just remain still and just trust the process. This is where, again, that basis of um, confidence is so key. 
And also this is why I'm talking about it, because when you know the terrain, it's easier to, to have confidence that this is happening as part and parcel of the path. It's not something strange. You're not losing your mind in any way. This is just the way the mind plays with perception um, when things get more subtle in the mind. And uh, the next one that's fairly commonly experienced, I've experienced this myself, is a sense of excitement, a sense of woo. <laughs> and it can be quite subtle again. You know, it's not that you start jumping and go, yay, there's a light or, or something like this. <laughs> But it's just something that um, it's a natural response of the mind, again, to something that happens that we're not familiar with. It feels like, oh, something's happening and I want to know. I want to know what's coming next. So we're moving a little bit into the future. You know, it's that movement into the future, whereas fear is a little bit like retracting, almost wanting to go back. The excitement is like what's coming next or just, again, wanting to be involved. And uh, Again, it's just a matter of relaxing and uh, letting the process happen and not getting overly impressed with these things as well. Because um, many, many different visions, even sometimes sounds can arise. Sometimes when people are meditating for a long time, they even start to smell lovely things. I remember one time smelling some kind of, I forget what it was now, some kind of cake or caramel or something like that. And I looked around me and, you know, I sort of looked around the area afterwards. I thought there's definitely no way anyone was baking. <laughs> but there was certainly some kind of smell. Sometimes it can come in even as beautiful music. It's just the way the mind interprets the happiness, if you like. So if you are sort of more um, a musical type of person, you might hear celestial singing or, or something like that. And I think, again, this is found in different traditions. Um, but most of these things are like a little bit interesting, perhaps a sign that you're getting peaceful, but not something to, uh, to kind of latch on to or talk about or assess your progress by. So many things can happen and sometimes the way these lights uh, manifest is also a bit unstable in the beginning. It's quite common for people to experience whole scenes. There was a time, I think it was a couple of years ago, in a retreat that um, it was during the uh, pandemic actually and I used to go on this little walk every morning for my exercise there was no one else there and it was really beautiful it was like between two rivers so it's actually called Mesopotamia it's just a little part of Oxford and uh, and there was all these trees coming over with leaves and they'd be glistening in the morning dew with the sunshine coming through and uh, yeah my mind was pretty content that retreat and uh, that afternoon I was meditating and then suddenly this vision came that was just like that view actually, only much more beautiful with lots of kind of glistly, glistening leaves and uh, it was very, very nice and I could feel myself kind of getting sucked into it and I could also feel at the same time part of the mind completely withdrawing at the same time. It was very strange, it was like magnetic, it was trying to pull me in and I was trying to kind of pull back thinking, oh no, that's, it's not the right time which is interesting, this can happen sometimes. And it probably wasn't the right time because that kind of image is a bit complicated for the mind to really settle into. But these kind of things happen in the beginning when nimittas arise. And then after some time, you, you start to learn which ones are kind of um, more conducive to peace, yeah? Less complex, less um, kind of... Uh, conducive to things like fear and excitement. So the ones that are helpful in the practice are the ones that are very um, simple and stable and quite beautiful as well. So sometimes this can be actually co-joined with the breath. You actually start to experience the breath as maybe being soft or being like cotton wool or being kind of glowing in the way, like it starts to glow or it starts to appear like light in the mind. And then that can start to become very, very still and very stable. And um, when the nimitta becomes really strong, there's a sense of it either can kind of suffuse the mind, envelop the mind, or you get sucked in. And of course, at that moment, it can be, again, this fear and excitement can come off. And it's OK. You know, this is um, a place where many meditators, you know, kind of practice with for years. Um, but 
but these things always energize the mind and they're always very joyful as well and this is um, one of their main purposes to bring that confidence that joy to the mind and to help us to learn how to actually stay steady even with the bliss because sometimes we think the practice is all about working with suffering and that's a very important part and we often think oh yeah we want the happiness we don't want the pain but when we actually get to these happy states we might find we don't want that either because <laughs> it's also a little bit challenging to the sense of self. It's like we have to get used to it. We have to become familiar with how to work with these things in a, in a balanced and calm kind of way. So not to get that kind of excitement. It's not you that's going to attain anything. In fact, this is an important lesson in learning how to disappear, how to let go. So the Buddha said again and again, <laughs> that samadhi comes from letting go. There's a beautiful phrase, vasagaramana karitva, labati samadhi, labati chitta e kagata. And that means um, that the mind becomes still and becomes one-pointed by letting go, by vasagga, which means relinquishing, giving up, um, renouncing, if you like. It's the same, a very similar word to those words that are found in the Third Noble Truth. Um, the way that leading to the end of suffering is letting go, freedom, giving things away. Yeah, it's a giving, it's not a getting, it's not an attaining. So it's very helpful to establish those attitudes in our practice that we're giving to the moment, we're giving to the breath. We're giving all our heart to that meta phrase that we're offering to our friend and later on with the meta even to our enemy, so-called enemy. You know, sometimes we get these sort of fixed perceptions of somebody as inherently bad or good, but it's all perception. So we can learn to actually uh, relate to all people, whether we like them or not, with thoughts and attitudes of loving kindness. So in the metta practice, how do we get into these deep states of meditation? And uh, again, we begin like we did earlier. We usually take a simple object to start with. And uh, I often start with the loved person. I think it's important to establish our mindfulness and a good relationship towards our body and mind, first of all. But as a meta object, it's usually easier to take a friend or a teacher or even someone like a grandchild that you just love unconditionally rather than ourself because we have a much more complicated relationship with ourself. You know, some people say you can't love another person unless you love yourself. But then we're really doomed, aren't we? Aren't we? I don't know, I just don't agree. <laughs> I think we can develop loving kindness wherever and however we can. It really isn't about the object, it's about the love itself. And the more love you can develop and, and share with others, the more you actually become resourced in yourself. You know, that meta recharges you, it softens you, it makes you less fault-finding and that attitude can be turned in on yourself. You know, and you might find it just coming up at various times throughout the day. You know, you might notice, okay, you spill your tea on somebody else's floor. Sorry, Marianne, I did spill a few drops this morning, but I cleaned it up. And <laughs> normally you might think, oh no, you stupid, what's it? But you can just say, oh, never mind, it'll be fine, you know, don't worry about it. And you just find yourself using much more kind and gentle speech even towards yourself. Uh, when you practice loving kindness to another. So we start by developing loving kindness to a friend or a loved person and then bit by bit we kind of widen the sphere of our love so we can start spreading metta to someone we don't really know very well, the so-called neutral person. And of course it's not that they are neutral, it's just that your feelings are kind of neither here nor there. You don't have a strong feeling of um, vested interest in their well-being, you don't have anything against them either. You just perhaps haven't noticed them very much. And uh, it's possible to even develop really strong feelings of loving kindness towards such people too, simply by recognizing they too are just like us. They have a past that we maybe don't know very much about, but we can be sure they've gone through their own struggles and difficulties you know, they've probably gone through the same stresses that we have at work or in relationships. And we can start to tune into our shared 
humanity, you know, that, that connects us to all beings. And then we can start to spread to the disliked person. I'm sure we all have someone. But don't start with a really difficult one. Just start with someone who you sometimes feel a little bit irritated with. Or, but it's nothing too traumatic that they've done to you or as a result that you've experienced trauma as a result of that. Um, that comes later on. And again, that can come up all by itself at the right time, as long as you're resourced. And that happened to me once. It, it was actually during practicing metta to my best friend that a thought of uh, an old friend who'd really hurt me very deeply came up. And uh, normally it would create quite a stir when I thought of what had happened, it would be quite re-traumatizing. But this time, it just kind of melted into the flow. It was really amazing. And I realized, wow, I can trust this intuitive wisdom of love. It has its own wisdom there. So anyway, the way that that metta sort of can lead us into the deeper meditation is by spreading it to the different categories, if that's helpful for you. Um, some people don't even bother with that, they just spread it in the different directions, the four directions and above and below. But I think this can actually, you can't be sure that you've really overcome the hindrances that way, because it's not about how far we can spread it, it's really about working with the hindrances in the mind and trying to overcome ill will. So when we go through the different categories, we can really test whether our metta is equal to all these different categories of beings. So by the time we do spread it to all beings, it becomes very, very all-encompassing. And the perception goes from individuals, many, to a sense of all, which is very similar to one, right? When it's all beings, there's something singular about that, and so the mind can become absorbed into that. So these samadhi states are really um, states of absorption, states of um, being of oneness between the object and the observer. So the mind and its object basically unify. <clears throat> and that's called chitta ekagata, one-pointedness of mind, or as Ajahn Brahm likes to point out, it could also mean one-peakedness, because the word aga can also mean peak. So depending where you split up that Pali word, it could mean the mind has now come to a peak, which is true in many ways. These are not... Um, states of dullness or states of trance. Um, they're very heightened states of powerful mindfulness. And uh, they say that uh, the highest mindfulness is in the fourth jhana, which is a very, um, a very, very deep state of stillness where you literally can't be moved. You can't be contacted at all by sound, even in the first jhana, if it's strong, strong enough. You, sound can bring you out, but while you're actually in that state, you can't here you can't really smell or feel very much at all you're completely immersed in the mind so um if these sound a bit far out of you know reach don't worry about it because we can't get there anyway by reaching for it but the point i want to convey is that this is all a gradual uh deepening of a sense of stillness a sense of contentment and a sense of peace yeah, so it's a happiness born from peace, born from letting go, and born from just many, many, many moments of contentment, of good mental karma, creating the causes for these things to arise. Yeah, relating to the world with eyes of loving kindness, friendly eyes, and that includes to our mental world, and uh, developing that contentment in every moment. So we don't stop there. <laughs> Happiness of samadhi is very wonderful, very empowering for the mind. And in the suttas it says it makes the mind malleable, it makes the mind soft. And the purpose of samadhi is to see things as they truly are. Yata bhuta jnana dasana. Samadhi, states of deep meditation, are the cause for seeing things as they truly are. And that is also their benefit. So sometimes people like to practice insight meditation, which is great. And there has to be a certain level of stillness, samadhi, sustained awareness with that. But the, it can be difficult if we haven't got enough of a sense of inner happiness based on sila, based on virtue. 
because some of these insights are very challenging to the sense of self. And the beauty about practicing a lot of metta and a lot of stillness, a lot of samadhi, is that by the time the mind looks in the direction of impermanence, you know, looks deeply at suffering, looks into non-self, basically asks the body and mind, what is it I take to be a self? Um, we're already resourced enough, stable enough, not to shake with these insights, not to break. Yeah, I have met people who have sometimes had a deep insight before they were really ready, and it kind of sends them spinning for a while because there just isn't that inner resource of well-being, especially if there's not enough virtue. Those insights don't tend to really yield a lot of fruit. But if you have this kind of uh, inner resource of well-being, then letting go is much easier because you're letting go not into a void, but into a sense of inner peace, a sense of inner stability. Yeah. So as you give up one thing, the happiness grows. It's not scary. You know, if the result of letting go, the result of renunciation is increased happiness, it becomes actually quite enticing and the mind becomes pretty uh, bold, you know, pretty confident that it can let go a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, stage by stage. So at that point also, the mind is um, soft, it's malleable, it can see whatever it wants to see, you know, it can point itself in any direction and see the truth, you know, be honest to that truth. And it's also very stable, so it can stay with reality for a long, long time, long enough to really start to penetrate the nature of this body and mind. So these are some of the um, benefits of the samadhi and how it comes from happiness. And again, just to end, I'd like to point out this second sutta. I mentioned the first one yesterday, that was the causal sequence from suffering. And this one is very, very similar, only it starts from virtue instead of from suffering. And from virtue, it goes into non-remorse and then into joy. Whereas the first sequence goes from suffering to confidence and then into joy. So confidence, precepts, sila, virtue, they're all kind of part and parcel of being on the path, starting on the path and having some confidence in, in uh, you know, developing wholesome deeds of body, speech, and mind, and the purpose of that. Um, but the difference with the second one is that it's talking about the sequence as a natural process. And uh, I'll just read through it to end, because it's just very simple, and the message is very clear. So the Buddha speaking to the monastic uh, community here, but really it can apply to all of us, any practitioner of meditation. And this is from the Anguttara 10, number 2. So I'll say community instead of monks. Community, that's all of us. For a virtuous person, one whose behavior is virtuous, no volition needs to be exerted. Let non-regret arise in me. It's natural that non-regret arises in a virtuous person, one whose behavior is virtuous. For one without regret, no volition may be, need be exerted. Let joy arise in me. It's natural that joy arises in one without regret. For one who's joyful, no volition need to be exerted. Let rapture arise in me. That's piti. It's natural that PT arises in one who is joyful. For one with a rapturous mind, no volition need be exerted, let my body be tranquil. It's natural that the body of one with a rapturous mind is tranquil. For one tranquil in body, no volition need be exerted, let me feel pleasure, that's sukha, or contentment. It's natural that one tranquil in body feels contentment. For one feeling contentment or pleasure, no volition need be exerted, let my mind be stilled. It says concentrated, but it's a bad translation. <laughs> let my mind be stilled, or unified, if you like. It is natural that the mind of one feeling pleasure is unified or stilled. For one who is stilled, no volition need be exerted, let me know and see things as they really are. 
it's natural that one who is still knows and sees things as they really are. So we'll stop there for now, but it carries on all the way to full enlightenment. And at the bottom it says, one stage flows into the next stage, one stage fills up the next stage, for going from the near shore, that's where we are now, to the far shore. So there we go. And uh, just to emphasize that no volition need be exerted, Ajahn Brahmali likes to say, it's not just that it doesn't need to be exerted, it's almost that it's redundant, it's not necessary, and it's also not possible at a certain stage on this path. It cannot be done by an act of will. It's done by putting the causes in place. So that's what we can do. That's what we have some agency around, perhaps not the content of our experience, but certainly the way we respond, the way we relate. And we can try to make that relationship wise and full of loving kindness wherever we can. So, that's plenty for me for now. So, I think we might go straight into some meditation. Does that sound good? Yeah? So, I'm glad to see some of you experimenting with uh, where you're seated. It's great. And uh, maybe trying something different. <laughs> How shall we do this? <laughs> would you like a guided meditation or would you like a silent meditation? Okay, how many people would like some guidance? Okay, and those who wouldn't, maybe you can just zone out, tune out of my voice. Notice the silence between the words. <laughs> and, uh, let the mind settle in that. <clears throat> and again, just to say, there's many different types of uh, meditators here, as in people doing many kinds of practices, some who've been practicing a long time, some for whom it's their very first meditation retreat. So I'm trying to sort of pitch it in a way that offer something to everybody, but uh, again, if my words don't resonate for you, then please just uh, continue in your own way. And remember, we're all just experimenting. There's no right or wrong outcome. We're just learning what works for us at any given time and learning to adapt that to the state of our mind right now. So. It's always for every meditation, every meditator, skillful to remind yourself at the beginning of the right motivation for practice, motivation to understand the way we cause suffering for ourselves and others, understand the mind. and to respond to that with compassion, with loving kindness, even with curiosity. So no meditation is wasted. Every opportunity to sit teaches something about our mind. And I find it always helpful to begin by establishing mindfulness of the body, first of all, and adding that kindness, so kindfulness, awareness, and a proper relationship with the felt sense of our body sitting or lying down. And the body sensations are so helpful to bringing us into the present moment. They're always happening right here. And there's not a lot we can really say about those sensations. They're just visceral, felt experiences beyond concepts, beyond words. 
Kind of just dropping gently down into your body. Starting, if you wish, from the top of the head. And just receiving any sensations. Mm. with a sense of curiosity and also warmth. Being kind to those sensations, even if your head is pounding or tight. Notice the effect of that friendliness. giving even the disagreeable sensations space, allowing them to be. And gently allowing that kindfulness to start spreading and suffusing every part of your body. Perhaps starting with the skin, noticing the touch of the atmosphere on the skin and any sensations, maybe tingling, coolness or warmth that you experience on the surface of your body, across the face. Allowing any tension to relax, softening the jaw. And just allowing that kindfulness to soak through as far as it will, without any force. Right into your shoulders, your arms, through your torso. All the way down to the tips of your toes. And sometimes to help relax, it can be wise to spend a little longer in any areas that do feel knotty or tight. to develop a proper relationship that gives these things space and kindness. Noticing the effect of kindness. For example, in a sore belly, feelings of anxiety perhaps. Just holding them gently with kindly eyes, allowing them to be. Just resting with a sense of the whole body, as though the whole body were basking in the light and warmth of the sun. Allowing the mind to rest 
with any feelings you experience in the body. Allowing the mindfulness to build as the energy flows into knowing, withdraws from doing. Truly takes a break, takes a retreat. And as the mind starts to come more into that feeling sense, you may start to notice gaps between your thoughts. Or the thoughts slowing down. Thinning out like gentle clouds, just wispy clouds passing by. And noticing the beauty of silence in those spaces. The beauty of that clear, sometimes cloudless sky. Being friendly to that. Those little moments of peace. The gaps. between the words. Allowing the mind to settle and enjoy the quiet, the warm, friendly silence that surrounds us.
and noticing the inclination of your mind. If you find disturbing or disagreeable thoughts are arising in the mind, you may wish to instead gently encourage the mind to have thoughts of loving kindness. dropping in a thought of loving kindness towards yourself or a loved person. Continuing with that for some time. Or if your mind is quiet and peaceful, you may naturally start to notice the breath and find refuge in the breath, a place to further settle and quieten the mind. Developing contentment with a single moment of breath, just one breath, the breath happening right now. Feeling it fully. Being present as you'd be present for a friend. The breath becomes your object of loving kindness. Whatever you're aware of is less important than the way that you're aware. So see if you can regard your own body, your own mind, and the objects of meditation the way you'd regard a friend, kindly, respectfully, with a sense of presence and deep listening, allowing the mind to quieten and enjoy the inner peace.
people over the day and the retreat. I'd really like to encourage you to continue to sit if you wish. And if you do want to move into some walking meditation, just take your time and reflect a little bit at the end of the meditation to notice how you're feeling now and why. If there is a little bit more peace lightness, spaciousness. What led to that? What kind of attitudes, ways of looking led to that peace? Or if there's agitation, distraction in the mind, What led to that? Maybe a busy lifestyle, it's quite natural. Maybe the way you related to your experience was not so skillful this time. So just checking in with yourself so that every meditation gives you an opportunity to learn about the way your mind works, the way this process works, and how to still the mind. to ring the bell. I'm just going to invite you to do what you need to do in your own time and uh, see if you can maintain the continuity for the next half an hour before the tea break at quarter past three. Maybe there can be a bell for that and uh, see if you can get into some walking meditation if your body needs a change. Uh, Sometimes you might feel a bit fed up after 10-15 minutes, but see if you can stay with it. Go through that feeling of boredom or tiredness and uh, it can become a very beautiful practice to deepen the continuity and even the peace.